coming this evening. My name is Angela Hall, and I am the admission manager for the College of Osteopathic Medicine. So on behalf of our office, welcome tonight. We are glad that you've joined us. Um, so I want to very briefly just kind of mention how the schedule is going to work tonight. Dr. Polk is going to speak with you for about 45 minutes uh, this evening, and then we will transition to Dr. Lewis, who's one of our OMM faculty, and he will discuss osteopathic medicine with you and also do a demonstration of OMM for those of you that um, have yet to experience or see it before. Then our current students um, are going to give you a tour of campus so you are able to see some of our labs in action of what happens here um, in terms of education for the osteopathic students. And then we're going to finally wrap up with a panel of our students so you can hear from them directly on their experiences as a DMU student. One thing I want to highlight is in your purple bags, you have note cards. So if there are times throughout the evening that you have a question, um, whether it's for the students primarily, but also Dr. Polk, feel free to write your questions out, and we will collect those later this evening to make sure that you get your questions answered before you leave tonight, okay? So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. J.D. Polk, who is the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he can tell you the rest. Thanks, Dr. Polk. Thank you, ma'am. Well, thanks for joining us. Just so I have an idea who all I'm talking to. How, how many are physicians? Uh, I, I knew we had a couple in here. How many are school counselors that are trying to get the skinny on things? I, 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 I talked to you in the hall, in the aisle, right? Yeah. You were stealing all the cookies. Uh, how, many are, how many are prospective students? Uh, good. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is give you an idea on the landscape, how things have, are, have changed, how things are changing, where they're going so that as you apply for medical school and so that the counselors know as well uh, what to look for, what things that uh, the admissions folks look for as well, and, and what, as a dean, what, what do we look for in administration when, when folks are applying. And, and it's bad in that, my, where's my two physicians again? It, uh, it's changed a lot since we went through. I mean, like all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, and so, you know, I'll, the students make fun of me because I'll make reference to some show that they've never heard of before. I had a faculty colleague that was dressed in a turtleneck the other day, and I said he looked like Mannix, and nobody had any idea who I was talking about. So, um, first let me give you a little bit of my background and how I got here. I'm actually uh, boarded in emergency medicine and ER trained. I uh, did my medical school at A.T. Still University, south of here in Missouri. I uh, did my residency in emergency medicine, was the chief resident in emergency medicine at Mount Sinai in Cleveland. I uh, did a lot of uh, ER and trauma in Cleveland. I uh, was the chief of LifeLight. Uh, LifeLight in Cleveland flies with a critical care physician and nurse. And so I spent half of my time in the level one trauma center as an ER attending and half on the helicopter going out to accident scenes and doing LVADs and all of those things. Uh, because I had an exorbitant amount of debt, uh, much like you all are going to inherit, uh, I joined the Air Force Reserve in order because they had a, a deal at the time uh, where they would pay off about 50 grand worth of your loans, which was a lot back then for me. Uh, and I thought, oh, it's only a weekend a month, two weeks in the summer, that won't be a problem. Uh, after I deployed uh, in wartime, I thought maybe uh, there's a little bit more to this than I thought. Um, and I, I got a lot of experience, unfortunately, in critical care air transport going back and forth to Germany. Uh, and then also uh, supported space shuttle launches and landings uh, and search and rescue on the helicopter there. Because when the space shuttle would go up, they would have four helicopters standing by in case the astronauts had to bail out. And, the, uh, and you know, serendipity happens. Uh, I happened, you know, to be down there about four or five missions, and the NASA flight surgeons said, you know, you're not bad at this. We got an opening at NASA. Why don't you come down? Uh, so your parents will understand this, but I, I just built our nice attending doctor house, you know, in the neighborhood where you go out to get the mail and you see all the other doctors and say, doctor, 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 and you get your mail. And we just built a nice house, got all the landscape done. And what happens usually when you get your house just the way you want it is you move. Uh, and so we moved down to Houston, took a 70 grand pay cut, and I started to work for NASA. Uh, and NASA has half of their mission uh, with the space station. Uh, they do half of their training in Moscow and half in the U.S. Uh, and so I actually lived in Moscow six months out of the year for several years, so I'm fluent in Russian, which does not help me in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, yet. Uh, although Nick and I can have a conversation, that's about it. 
Um, and I worked my way up as the chief of med ops at, at NASA and then the chief of clinical operations at NASA and the chief of all of space medicine at NASA and was there for a decade. And then, uh, do you all remember the Chilean mine accident? Uh, I was the consultant from NASA that went down to figure out how to get 33 Chilean miners out of a mine. Uh, and then from there, was invited by the White House to be the principal deputy assistant secretary of Homeland Security. So I went to D.C. to do that job and then uh, became the assistant secretary of Homeland Security. And then Dr. Uh, Janet Napolitano, who was my boss, told me in April that she was leaving uh, Homeland Security to be the uh, president of University of California. And usually when the secretary tells you that she's leaving, that's kind of code for, by the way, there's going to be a new secretary who likes their own assistant secretaries. So it's a really good time to get your CV brushed up. And so uh, I applied for the dean spot that opened up about the week after that. And here I am, a year and six months later. I will tell you that things have changed a lot in medical school, but they are still changing. And I've got a few slides that I'll just go over as a memory jogger for some of the things that are changing. And I don't know if I have a little clicker to do this remotely, but I'll see what I can do here. So one thing for admissions, <clears throat> it's changed drastically and that it's now a holistic process. Well, what does that mean? That means before it used to be your GPA and your MCATs, uh, and that was it. But now we've discovered that that's not the whole story. And the reason that we do that, oh, thanks. Thanks, you're much obliged. Which button is it, this one? That one, okay. Um, and I'll give you a, a good example. Let's say somebody's got a 3.4 GPA, but they're working full time as well and they've got one kid at home that they're trying to take care of in between times, uh, is that person the same as somebody that has a 3.8 that took six years to get through their four-year school, did you know 12 credit hours per semester, uh, has no responsibilities, daddy paid for everything, and they're not working at all? Probably not. Uh, you know, so a grade doesn't tell you everything. Um, and so the, one of the things that they're looking at now, and, and the MCAT has not been very predictive for us. Uh, I know that's a shocker to you all, but you know, that the question of a, what is the coefficient of, and tangent of an angle of a box sliding down an inclined plane uh, doesn't really translate well into what kind of doctor you're going to be. Big shock. Uh, now they're redoing the MCAT this year. And so we'll talk about some of that as well. So there's changes to the MCAT. Is that me going all over the place? Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, everybody's getting dizzy. Uh, so it's a holistic process. What they will do is they will bring you in and, and look at the whole aspects of your application. What things have you done uh, for other than medical school uh, application? Have you done any volunteer work? Uh, do you work part-time while you're going to school? Do you do X? Uh, you know, are you um, volunteering uh, at the homeless shelter? Are you doing, uh, you know, a, a church trip to Cambodia to do medical trips, that type of thing? Um, and a lot of what they're looking for now is a, what I call a service before self mentality. You know, I'll show you a slide on that as well. Uh, GPA, especially science GPA. Now, we do worry somewhat about GPA and that. Um, if you have a 3.0, um, you're going to struggle, and we don't want to accept you if you've only got a 2.9 or a 3.0, because it would be unfair for us to allow you to accrue 50 grand worth of debt in your first year, knowing that you're not going to succeed, quite bluntly. Um, and the biggest thing for medical school, and the change between undergraduate and medical school, the, the substance material is not horribly hard. All of you in this room can understand the stuff that folks are lecturing about and can conceive it. The biggest part of medical school is the volume. You are literally, most of you are used to probably taking, I, I'll go on an assumption, about 15 credit hours per semester. Now strap on 25. Uh, and, oh, by the way, labs and studying, and uh, you're going to be in some student groups and doing some volunteering and doing uh, other things as well. Uh, so that's the biggest change that we see. And, and initially what we do, when students are 
you know, we have dual degrees that they can take. You can take your MPH and your DO, or your DO and your M MHA, and things like that. We don't allow anyone to do a dual degree course their first semester, because what we see typically is there's a little culture shock when folks get here. They're going through anatomy, and sometimes it's the first time people have seen a dead body. Now, not only are you seeing it, you're carving on it and doing dissection. And by the way, we're going to all, how many of you have had biochem? I imagine most of you, if not all of you. Yes. Uh, all of the biochem that you had in undergrad, we will cover in the first three weeks. Uh, after that, your, what you learned in undergrad in biochem has been exhausted. Uh, and so a lot of people think, oh, I've had biochem. This won't be that bad. Uh, it won't, it's not that it's that bad. It's just that it's at a much higher level. And so we literally are going to cover all of your biochem that you've had before in the first three weeks. Week four, it's starting anew for you. So it's, it's a huge volume that people are like, oh, my gosh. And I've got a test on Monday. And then I've got another test on Tuesday. And then I have a test on Thursday. And I've got a lab on Friday. And it seems like it's never ending. And now it's not to dissuade you from going into medical school. Everyone's like, oh, great. I don't think I'm going to apply now. But that's the biggest thing is that it's not that the information is hard or that you are not intelligent enough to acquire it and know it, because that's not the case. It is the volume. Um, is that any, any medical students uh, want to throw in an opinion on that one? What do you guys think? Nick? <laughs> Wait, would you, what would you say was the biggest culture shock for you, all, all of you guys? Was it the volume? Was it the, uh, or the type of information? Yep. Yep. Now, one thing that has changed to their advantage, which us old physicians did not have, um, now everything's recorded. So that if, you know, I didn't feel like going to biochem today, I could watch the biochem lecture this afternoon on MPEG. Uh, or before the exam, if I didn't get a concept, I could watch it two or three times until I got the concept. Whereas when we went through, somebody wrote with on chalk, they don't know what chalk is, by the way, chalk, <laughs> And he raced with the other hand, and if you didn't get it at the time, then you'd check it at note pool, right? And then, and if you didn't get there at note pool, you were screwed. And, and now they've got it to where they can see it anytime they want. And so I, I'm jealous of that sometimes. Uh, but that also means, you know, in, in, in Gen Y, they're used to sitting down at Starbucks and, and cranking it open and putting their headphones on and listening to Foo Fighters and... Uh, and uh, doing it. And that's, that's not something that, that our generation is used to. So how they learn has changed a great deal as well. Uh, we've got volunteer efforts. That's what they're going to look for as well. Uh, as we talked about a service mentality. Additional activities tell us something about you as a person. Distance traveled. Distance traveled is uh, did folks have or overcome hardship? That's not to say that you all have to have a hardship. But we look at some of those things as well when we you know, if somebody's got a 3.4, but they're a single parent, they're taking care of two kids and working a job at night and on the weekends, that means something to us. Uh, that means that when they only have to worry about medical school and hopefully somebody's helping with their kids, that why, they might actually do better because they're, they have less responsibility than they did before. Uh, so we look at those things. And then interviewing. What do, you know, some schools don't interview. Some, you know, some just go by the paper aspects. Uh, we can tell a lot by the interview. A lot of it is based on the EQ. We're looking for you to see what your emotional intelligence is. Uh, are you thinking like an adult? Are you thinking like a future physician would be? Um, and so those are things that we're looking at. Now, MCAT changes. Uh, imagine most of you have probably this many books studying for the MCAT. Uh, the MCAT is changing in that they are adding what I would call the soft sciences as well. So they're putting sociology uh, into the MCAT and some of the other softer sciences into the MCAT. Now, why would, any idea why they're doing that? Anybody got any guess? A couple of reasons. One, to be more holistic. And I'll, I'll give you a good example. If I see a, a 12-year-old overweight child in my office 
who is pre-diabetic, bordering, you know, on, on diabetes. And I write them for a script uh, for something for glucose control. Is that going to solve the issue? And the answer is no. It, especially if that child's from a, a school in the inner city and lower socioeconomic class where there, there is no whole foods across the street. And maybe their only uh, access to food is the McDonald's across the street. And the schools have four vending machines with loaded with crap in them. Uh, so unless you address some of the social aspects and the aspects beyond the office, uh, you're not going to take care of that patient or solve that patient's issue. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons they're bringing in some of the soft sciences. The other one, quite frankly, is because we are not getting a lot of doctors going into primary care. And so if you are a genius in physics and a genius in organic chemistry, but you fail in sociology, that tells me something about you. That tells me, hmm, you might be in the research area, but you probably are not going to be the primary care physician. You, you don't like my... <laughs> Drew, Drew's getting vertigo, so he's, he's decided, thank you. Uh, he decided rather than have you all throw up, uh, that he would change that. Uh, so they're making some changes to that. What, what does that mean? I, I will tell you, first of all, we, we see quite often that there is about a six-point spread between those who take a prep course for the MCAT versus those that don't. So if, if you take the MCAT and you didn't do so hot, let's say you got a 22 on it, uh, you can take it again. We get both your scores, but if, if your next score is 28, we take the 28, and that's what we hold on to. Uh, so we see consistently those that do a prep course do better. A lot of it is just getting used to those types of questions and how to answer those. So if you haven't done a prep course or if you haven't taken the MCAT, I do recommend it, uh, just to get you in the habit of seeing those types of questions and what they're going to do. But the MCAT, as I said before, does not necessarily tell us whether or not you're going to be a good doctor. So we have what's called a mean with a fair wide spread on some of those things. So our mean right now is uh, 28.5 or 29. I can't remember what it is this year. Angela would have to correct me. So you know, some schools will shoot for the high 30s uh, or the mid 30s for their MCATs. So that, I, I will tell you, those folks are typically going towards the research end of things. Uh, the folks that are in that, that soft, nice point that we like is between that area of 27 and 32, uh, with a mean being around 28.5 or 29. Um, and then, you know, that doesn't mean that if you get a 26 that you're not getting in, but it means you have an uphill battle that you might have to show that your GPA is, is good enough, that your other skills, the other things in your application uh, are good enough. And so, again, remember, it's a holistic process. Grades. And so this is, a, this is to show you, this is a table from the 2011-2013 applicants accepted to at least one medical school with their GPA and their MCAT. And so what you see is that obviously the higher on either side, the better you do. Now the, the purplish burgundy circle is DMU, is where we're looking at folks for. Um, you know, are we looking for the MCAT of 39 and a GPA of 4.0? No, because that's not our mission. Our mission is to create primary care physicians for the most part and to create folks that know a lot about everything, not a lot about one thing, uh, such as researchers, et cetera. And so you will see that you know, a lot of our students that get accepted may get accepted to more than one medical school, uh, but we have great stats and data to show who is going to be successful here and then how are they going to match into residency and how does that turn into primary care physicians? That doesn't mean that you can't be something else, like a rocket scientist at NASA. Uh, it just means that that's our mission mostly is aimed at primary care. Service before self, uh, we see this a lot with a lot of our applicants. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that you have to go and afford a really expensive trip to Honduras. Uh, but it does mean that we want to see, are you doing something like volunteering with the Red Cross? Are you doing something like being a medical scribe? Are you doing uh, something that shows that you are volunteering or doing some type of service? Um, and especially in this particular generation, quite frankly, we're looking for folks that are thinking beyond me 
Uh, and so that's one thing that we look for. And, and that's probably one of the things that separates the osteopathic world from the allopathic world more is that we probably have more volunteer hours in the osteopathic world with our students than they do on the MD side. The, the last class that graduated had, what was it, Tom, about 45,000 hours when they graduated uh, between all of the students uh, uh, for their four years of medical school. Uh, that's a lot of hours uh, for the graduating class. Now, that, that, that's a lot of different things. That's volunteering at the homeless shelter. That's, uh, you know, doing the service trips and global health. That's, uh, you know, doing things like uh, putting in smoke alarm batteries for the Red Cross and homes. So that's one of the things that we look for. It doesn't have to be grandiose. You don't have to say, I went and saved 40 Ebola patients in Liberia. Uh, you know, good on you if you're able to do that, but it doesn't have to be grandiose. It just has to show that you have a service mentality, okay? Fit. We're also looking for fit. Uh, you know, uh, we're looking to see if this class pulls in, and we pull all these folks in. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I don't want everybody to look the same. I don't want a carbon copy of, of each medical student. I want, when you are in class, for there to be a wide dispersion of race, religion, background, where you're at, because you're all going to learn from each other as well. When we have discussions on diversity, uh, you know, how you treat somebody in rural Iowa is different than how you treat somebody, perhaps, in downtown New York. Uh, you know, and, and the, the students get a lot of diversity training as well. Uh, you know, a lot of that can be on race, and a lot of it can be on handicap, a lot of it can be on the LGBT aspects, uh, but to make sure that when you're approaching a patient that you approach them with that mindset uh, of, of looking at, at their particular uh, risks from their diversity and their profile, uh, knowing that you are aligning treatments according to their different social backgrounds as well that they're going to be able to follow. Uh, and so we look at that also on admissions to make sure that we have a broad and diverse background of folks that we are bringing in. We do not want to have 220 students that all came from West Des Moines. Uh, you know, it's got to be a little bit broader than that. <clears throat> Where's medical education headed? Medical education, to be honest, has not changed much in the last 100 years. There was the Flexner Report, uh, you know, back, golly, I think it was 1910 or 1915, somewhere in there. Uh, and the Flexner Report was, all right, anatomy, physiology, all of these things that we do now. And, in, and medical school has, for 100 years, been the sage on the stage. Somebody talking to a chart, PowerPoint, or Blackboard. Um, <clears throat> and it's morphing from that. It's morphing from that to do case scenarios and things. Uh, and to give you patient exposures earlier on so that uh, what we found is that you'll tend to remember things if you can relate it to a patient. If I sat up here and talked to you about diabetic ketoacidosis for an hour, your eyes would glaze over. But if I had a diabetic ketoacidosis patient in front of you, and you smell the ketones from that patient, and you see how they're tach tachypnic and tachycardic, et cetera, you will remember that for the rest of your life. And so how to put some of those things in context where you are in your first semester, you are not used to touching people unless it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, or significant other, and suddenly you're going to be touching each other, uh, up close and personal, doing you know, OMM and physical exam and et cetera, and physical diagnosis and in the spalls, you're going to be asking folks questions, total strangers, questions about their sex life. We are not used to doing that in the general public. But as physicians, you have to get used to that. Uh, and you have to not only get used to it, but you have to look comfortable doing it so that you don't make them uncomfortable. Uh, and so a lot of that is breaking down your social barriers that you have built up for 20 years because you're not used to doing those things. Most of us, you, and you can, you can see the difference in the students, by the way, uh, when, when we, they first get there, they have the, the 18 inches of clearance, right, uh, that we all learn somehow mis mysteriously when we're in line. You know, you don't get any closer than 18 inches when you're in the line at Kmart or et cetera. 
Uh, and so you'll see the students. I can tell when the students are here the first week, they've got that 18 inches of clearance when they're in the cafeteria. But, and then three months later, after they've been used to hugging on each other, crunching each other, and doing everything else, it's like, hey, man, you want to eat that cookie? And, and right on top of each other. <clears throat> so, you know, we all have some social barriers that we have built up um, uh, because, you know, it, from politeness sake and et cetera, which as physicians, you violate every day. I mean, it's, you know, we do a lot of checking our prostates and, uh, you know, you got to get over that. And, and you can't be fearful of saying, well, Mr. Johnson, you're 46 and uh, you got a little delayed stream. Guess what? Love you. Hugs, kisses. We're going to do a prostate exam today. You can't say, oh, that's, ooh, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, it's, it's now a different venue. You are a physician. You are thinking much differently. Um, which, by the way, uh, you, because you are dissecting people and you start to look at anatomy and physiology, uh, and, and not to say that you look at patients as anatomy and physiology. You still look at the patient and the whole patient, et cetera, but you don't view them in the same way. Um, you know, p- people always, my wife always wonder, all right, how do you do paps and pelvics and stuff? Honestly, it's anatomy at that time. You are focused on it's the anatomy and you're worried about the malady at the time. It is not all of those social things that you have thought about and learned about over the last 20 years. It is the anatomy. Uh, and so you, you get in that habit. You're, you have a different mindset when you're a physician. But where is that going? It's going to change. Partly from Gen Y, they weren't they learned electronically. Used to be you had to be you know mandatory attendance at medical school. Now you can watch the lecture from Starbucks. Uh, some of these things are going to migrate to all right. Some of these coursework things you're going to learn on your own at different times, and then you're going to come in and talk about the case scenarios at medical school. And so you know I I don't need to lecture to you about diabetic ketoacidosis, I can, you can watch the lecture at night, the night before, and then we'll have two diabetic patients come in, and then we'll talk about their symptoms and have people rotate and examine them. That's where things are going to be moving. And where's medicine headed? Now, this one's an interesting one. Whether you like the Affordable Care Act or not, there are changes from the, that are coming about from the Affordable Care Act. Um, <coughs> and I will, I will tell you, I sincerely doubt that the whole thing will get repealed. Pieces of it might get be, you know. I've never seen any policy, quite frankly, that was ever invented by government that didn't get morphed or changed to a version two and version three and, and added on or changed or morphed over time. And that'll happen with this as well. But one of the things that it did is it creates, because you have more people covered, you, it creates a demand for primary care physicians. Uh, and that, quite frankly, is where DOs have an advantage over our MD brethren. Uh, we create more primary care physicians than, than anybody. On average, uh, the average DO medical school creates, you know, in their graduating class, greater than 50% are going into primary care. Uh, in a typical MD school, that's about 30% or less. Uh, and a lot of that, there's different factors for that. Uh, part of it is debt. You know, if you've got $220,000 worth of debt, suddenly plastic surgery lo- and, uh, you know, Ferrari looking really good to you right now. Uh, and so it's hard to convince somebody to go into primary care where they might be struggling uh, for a while, uh, although it's going to change drastically in that case. It's also different than when we went to school in that you could go and then set up your own office. And that is going by the wayside. Now physicians are becoming group practices and members and, and employed by the hospital themselves. Why is that? Well. Let's take the electronic medical record, for example. Now, in order to get reimbursed, you have to have your patient documentation in the electronic medical record, and you have to have what's called meaningful use, meaning that you use that record meaningfully to look at the metrics and the outcomes to project how that patient's going to do. You have to have data that you send back to the government. And how much do you think an electronic medical record system costs, and especially one that does meaningful use and does all this stuff? Dr. Pettit, what do you think? Yeah. So if you had to guess what the average cost is, what would you say it is? For an EMR. Yeah, 
That's exactly it. About a hundred thousand for a for just the you know the Pinto version. That's not the Cadillac version. You guys don't even know what a Pinto is. Uh, <coughs> I have to change that. I have to I have to come up with some new stuff. Uh, nobody knows what a Pinto is. But I will tell you. Whereas the older generation are all. I don't know if I want to go work for the hospital, and uh, you know, they're, you know, I don't want, I want to have my own practice. The younger generation not so much worried about that, because they are more worried. You know, in in our day, it was uh, we didn't have restrictions on how long you worked in residency. We worked our tail off till you were blue in the face, and we didn't have restrictions on moonlighting, and we didn't have restrictions on a lot of other things. Now, and it was nothing to carry a pager and get called at night and on weekends all the time. This generation does not want that. This generation wants to have a family life, actually see their kids grow up and actually go to the little Cindy's, uh, you know, dance rehearsal uh, and not miss every Christmas and every New Year. Uh, and so, you know, that, that we used to wear that as a merit badge in the past. Well, you know, I haven't been to seven Christmases. Like, like that was, you know... <laughs> That was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a tough working cardiologist. He hadn't been to seven Christmases. Uh, and, you know, that's no longer a merit badge anymore. Folks in this generation want to be able to have work life balance. Uh, and so that's more important to them. So, it, you know, it, when we say to the younger generation, oh, you might have to work for the hospital, and they think, okay, I got Blue Cross Blue Shield, I got this, I got days off, somebody's going to cover, and I'm only on call every fifth night. Deal. Uh, and that's a lot different than what we went through. But that's some of the changes that are coming. Residency is, and this is the hard part, if you look at that, those lines, a couple of things that aren't told by those lines. Right now, and this is, this is the biggest thing to consider when you are choosing a medical school. Right now, what we will talk, you'll hear people talk about GME. GME is graduate medical education, which is a fancy word for residencies. Right now, there are 26,000 first-year residency slots, meaning that after somebody graduates from medical school, there are 26,000 slots that they can go to. There are 38,000 people applying for them. You have the foreign medical grads, you have the Caribbean schools, you have people that didn't get in last year, so you have literally about 12,000 more people applying for the slots than there are slots. And to the victor go the spoils, meaning only the strong get in. Uh, If you just barely squeaked by in medical school and you went to a third or fourth tier medical school that didn't have a great reputation, your risk is high of not getting into residency. The number one reason for not getting into residency, number one, according to the National Residency Match Program, and I'm on their board, is failure of part one of the boards. You fail part one of the boards, uh, you know, you take three board exams. You fail part one, you're going to have an uphill climb to get residency. So those things are things that you need to look for when you are applying to medical school. One of the biggest, you know, the first ones is board scores. What, what are your board scores? And when you, when you ask that question, the, the, the benchmark that you want to look for is 95%. All schools try to have at least, all of their students have at least a 95% pass rate on the boards. That's the benchmark. And that's the one that they need to at least climb over. If a school doesn't meet 95%, you need to run. Run away not run to, run away, because that's a danger sign. That means that you are at high risk to not getting your residency. Um, <clears throat> the national average for board scores uh, is about 96.8, almost 97 this year. And so you want to know, all right, are you below the mean, at the mean, or above the mean? Because uh, that's an important thing to know. Uh, DMU right now had a 98% pass rate this last year. So we got... You know, I'd like to make it 100 if I could. We're going to try to squeak it out there. And the students know that I have I've whipped and flogged and beaten them lately. Um, but they also know why uh, we're doing that, to make, give them the absolute best opportunity to match uh, into their residency. So that's the thing you need to look for, the first thing. What are the board scores? If somebody doesn't hand, give you a handout that shows what their board scores are, or if it's not on their website, those are red flags. 
uh, it should be transparent enough, and if it's good enough, they'll put, they'll want to market it. They'll want to boast about it. They'll put it on their website. So look for those things. Student satisfaction. Uh, studentdoctor.net, right? Is that the website? Um, or what, what's the, uh, what's the other one? What's the preferred one? Oh, no, you're right. I just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like all websites, you know, you, you get what, you know, you pay for and it's free. So it's, uh, you'll get opinions in wide variety. But if you see a, a large amount of students that are currently in the medical school that are very unhappy and dissatisfied, then that's a red flag as well. Now, the thing about uh, that is it also depends on when you ask. Because I guarantee you ask any medical student in May of their second year how they're doing, and they're not doing very well. Because uh, they're really stressed because they got finals at that time, and it's a really tough time in their second year when everything gets piled in. But, you know, those are things to look for and look to see, is there a, a reputation? And, and when you Google things, if you see, you know, so-and-so university sued for the ninth time for X, yeah, it might be something to maybe, you know, be leery of. Um, debt ratio. How much debt are you going to inherit? The average medical student, student debt upon graduation is $220,000. Uh, my first house was only $100,000. Uh, what was your first house? Wow, okay. So this, <laughs> you're beating me on that one. So, I mean, this, 20, man. Yeah. I mean, that's $220,000. Can you imagine paying $220,000 for school? I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. That, and, and most of these students that come out don't realize that that's equal to a mortgage. You're essentially paying two mortgages when you get out. And by the way, when you're a resident, you're not making $100,000 a year. Uh, so you're, you're kind of strapped for those first three, four years. And by the way, you've got to start paying them back uh, within a year after you graduate. So there's, you know, it's, it's tough. And so what are the things that you want to look at? You want to look at um, if this school is expensive, uh, is it worth it? All right, you know, maybe if you're going to Harvard and Yale, yes. But other th places, maybe not. And so are they in the first, second, or third, or fourth tier as far as expense? If you ranked uh, all of the medical schools of the same size and same weight with the same GPAs, et cetera, where would they be ranked? Now, I will tell you, state schools are typically cheaper than private schools. Uh, so we're, we are more expensive than the average state school, but we are less expensive than the average private school. We're actually in the third tier. You've got Kirksville and Kansas City, and all those are more expensive than we are. Um, and so you need to look at that. I mean, there's, there's a little bit to that. You don't want to be, you know, come out with a massive amount of debt with $300,000 worth of debt. Uh, but look at those things. And then also look, you know, there, are there payback programs? The state of Iowa just started a program right now to where they will pay off $200,000 of debt, whether it was undergrad or graduate, if you agree to stay in Iowa for five years after your residency. Uh, and I've had students say, oh, I don't know if I want to stay in Iowa for five years just for 200000 It's not just for 200000 you got to remember, that's 200000 paid off over 20 years at two above T-bill, which is equal to about $680,000 over 20 years. That's three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, if somebody would say, I will pay you three quarters of a million dollars to sweat it out in Iowa for five years and pay off all your debt, uh, you would suck it up in Iowa. Uh, and, uh, Nobody shoots at you in Iowa. I, I, I went for 50000 to the military, and it was a little bit different uh, climate than the back roads of Iowa. Uh, so you got to look at some of those things. Some communities now, we have a, a graduate, she's a fourth year, who uh, was a dual degree student. She, she got, she's getting her DO and her MSA uh, this year. And we had a community actually give her a contract to come back and be their surgeon. She hasn't even graduated medical school yet. They will pay off all of her debt, every bit of it, and pay her an incentive and start up her office for her if she agrees to come back. I think it's for seven years in Iowa. Uh, and so, you know, she's matching uh, to, a, to a, hopefully a surgery residency uh, coming up here in a couple of months. But we already have folks seeking out students in their fourth year to pay off their debt. Um, core rotation sites. Uh, well, let me, before I go to that, match rate. Match rate is a very important thing as well. What is the match rate? It's, the goal is not to just 
graduate from medical school. The goal is to actually match to a residency and internship so that you can get enough money eventually when you become a full-fledged doctor, residency trained board certified to pay off your loans and treat patients. Match is how many of the students graduated matched to an internship and residency. Again, the benchmark in the country is 95%. The average is 97%. Uh, we were at 100% last year. Uh, and so those are the things that you want to look for. If somebody's less than 95%, that's a red flag. Core rotation sites, where do they do their rotations? Some, some schools do it just locally, usually big cities. Uh, Chicago, all the students rotate locally. That's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in that they don't have to travel very far. Uh, it's a bad thing in that if nine of you want to do ophthalmology and there's only one ophthalmology slot in Chicago, you're, not doing, you're all competing for it. We have our core rotation sites in, Angela, help me, 32 cities now? 30, uh, so we, we do core rotation sites in Columbus, Ohio, and Cleveland, Ohio, and Michigan, and Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and Florida, and et cetera. Uh, and that makes it hard for us in some ways in that we, I have to send an assistant dean to visit all of those sites and do checklists on quality, et cetera, to make sure the quality of the rotations is up. Uh, but also, it helps the students, though, in that I'll give you an example. Let's, Brian, you know, you want to go into ophthalmology. If Brian wants to go into ophthalmology and he goes to Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State has ophthalmology, uh, Grandview has ophthalmology, or, or Grant, rather, uh, you know, Riverside has ophthalmology. So there's like four hospitals there that have op ophthalmology. So if you're rotating in that city and you rotate through those hospitals, the chances of you matching in ophthalmology, much higher. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons we have them all over the place. I'll speed up because I know I'm running out of time. That's why Angela's looking at me with concern. Uh, a curriculum, you know, as we talked about, what are the curriculum changes that are going to occur? Are they updating their curriculum constantly? Um, a good example is like ultrasound. Ultrasound's now a bedside tool. You, you know, you see ultrasound in, in ortho and OB-GYN and ER and family practice looking at, you, know, you, you it's almost ubiquitous. It's almost like the stethoscope these days. Do they include ultrasound in the curriculum? The answer is yes. Uh, starting in the fall, it goes into anatomy and several other places, and eventually we'll incorporate it in OMM as well. Um, and then the reputation, you know, obviously the reputation. If people see that this student is from X school, do they think, oh my gosh, no, or do they think yes? I'll go faster on this one. Surviving medical school, as we talked about, volume, time management, building blocks, integrity. This is a big one for me. I will tell you, although the students will tell you that I'm probably the most approachable dean that you'll ever meet, I'm also a hard ass and that if you cheat or if you steal, you're out. Um, and it's not like in years past where you got put on probation, et cetera. I view, quite frankly, all of my students as would I want to see them over top of my wife or child after they graduate. And so I've probably tossed out more people than any other dean. Uh, if they've cheated or if they've stolen or if they've had a lack of integrity, they're gone, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. No, 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 no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just the way it is. Uh, and so... Um, you know, we've had folks and I've had people call, but my dad's a surgeon at so-and-so. Well, great. Maybe he can get you a job at the McDonald's across the street because you're not going to be a doctor at my medical school. Um, wellness. We're big on wellness. They want you to be, you know, they, they, we want you in the gym. And if I don't see you in the gym, uh, then I will say something to you as well. If, if, you know, it's, it's nice that you are always hitting the books, but I also want to see you in the gym. The dean's in the gym. Uh, now, everybody makes fun of me because I have to wear my bifocals in the gym to see what weights I'm putting on. Uh, and the smart aleck last week who said, where's the AED, Dr. Polk's in here. Uh, yeah, so they, they do recognize when I'm in there. Um, you know, involvement, we have a lot of volunteer hours, as I said. Support from family and friends, also very important. Uh, this is the malpractice bowl picture. We actually have a a very collegiate game of football that we play against the Drake Law School. Um, so it's the DMU Medical School versus the Drake Law School. We always come up with interesting shirts to wear, not necessarily politically correct, uh, to disparage the other team. Uh, the one that our folks had this last year said, is there a lawyer in the house? Said nobody ever. Uh, and so... <laughs> yeah. 
couple things just to remind you. Uh, big numbers that you need to hold on to, you know, like the 98% first-time pass rate. Uh, 62% is how many people go into primary care. 100% is the match rate. Um, third tier as far as the expense, et cetera. Uh, 35, those are our clinical sites, uh, core sites. And then 40 are the number of countries that we go to for global health. You can do a rotation in your fourth year to 40 different countries. And speaking of global health, we are one of the only medical schools. In fact, we were the first initially to have the agreement with uh, the World Health Organization. We send two students, uh, typically between their second and third year. Uh, It's fairly competitive to to get to do it. But we send two students to Geneva, Switzerland, to learn uh, world health policy and to do health policy. And, you know, I was worried about passing biochem when I was in medical school. I I didn't ever have the thought or opportunity to go to Geneva, Switzerland, and work on global health policy for two months. But we have that. We also have rotations at the CDC and Centers for Disease Control. That's where one of the few medical schools other than Emory uh, that has that as well. And, of course, we do a lot of global health trips as well. Uh, Research. We do a lot of research here. In fact, Uh, We've increased the number of grants and research by 77% in the last two years. Uh, We've got a a huge research portfolio. Uh, Unfortunately, we're being so successful at it, we're running out of room. Uh, We are going to have to expand our facilities eventually. We're at max on the animal care facility right now. Uh, We've got a lot of good faculty doing a lot of interesting research. Uh, The one on the left, the far left bottom, I have to tell you about, we've got... Uh, several anthropologists that are in the anatomy program. They, uh, uh, I was worried as the dean because one of the things they did, they got a big uh, you know, NSF grant, which is hard to get, first of all, to get the, the national grants right now in this current climate. But they got a grant to go look at DNA in this Paleozoic cave. It was a blind cave that the animals would fall off this cliff and go plunking down into this cave for tens of thousands of years. And so this cave, 60 foot down, had all of this DNA from animals for you know, 100,000 or more years. Uh, and so they, were, they rappelled down into this cave to get the DNA to look at changes in the DNA and certain animal structures with climate change. And so my worry from the dean, of course, is and, you know, none of them were repellers. They had to go take repelling lessons. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure they can get down. The problem is getting up. You know, I, I, for those of you, if any of you have ever repelled, and I have done so in the military, the going down thing, you know, it's scary for you because you're, you're holding on, you're repelling down. That's not the bad part. The bad part is going up and trying to figure out how to pull yourself up and pull your body weight up, especially if you're hauling DNA samples and bones and other things. Uh, but fortunately, they got through it. I was trying to figure out how I was going to write that down in workman's comp, uh, but fortunately, you didn't have to. As we talked about, how do they do clinical integration? We have a huge Simmons ball, which you'll see on the tour tonight. Uh, You know, as we talked about with ultrasound and with the clinical rotations, there are a lot of things that we are incorporating. Uh, I I want you to make mistakes, but I want you to make them in the Simmons ball lab. I don't want you to make them on Mrs. Johnson or my wife or my kids. And so we'll do a lot of these things ahead of time. And then for my strategic plan is really easy. We're, We're increasing Iowa GME or residencies in Iowa. We're, we're innovating new and different osteopathic education, whether it's incorporation of ultrasound, whether it's incorporation of things like quality of care, uh, preventive medicine, et cetera, into the curriculum. Uh, and we have a lot. The students are great leaders. We have uh, leadership courses and integrated leadership uh, here as well. And so I don't want them to just be primary care physicians, et cetera. I want them to be leaders in whatever they do. Uh, and so that's... That's it from my standpoint. I think I was just a little bit over. That's pretty good. That's good for me, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.